My name is Pastor Hal York. I'd like to welcome you to our service this morning. It's August the 30th, 2020. It's the last Sunday in August. It's hard to believe. We're already at the end of August, and next week is going to be a busy week for a lot of people, it's going back to school and so on. And uh, so we know uh, there's a lot going on, and we're glad you're able to join us today. As the vacation time is wearing down, and uh, everybody's getting back home and back from their cottages and so on. So we know people are beginning to come back to church and trickle in, and we're glad you're here. And we trust you've had the opportunity to, uh, to view the, the songs and the announcements as they were being uh, played beforehand and able to just to sing and to worship the Lord in your heart and maybe with your some friends and maybe just sing those songs. Hopefully we knew most of them, and uh, but wonderful songs of worship and uh, reminding us of the great God that we do serve. I want to just read uh, Psalm 146, a few verses to begin. It says, Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord while I live. I will pr sing praises to my God while I have my being. Do not trust in princes, in mortal man in whom there is no salvation. His spirit departs, he returns to the earth, and that very day his thoughts perish. How blessed is he who help, whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Let's just look to the Lord in prayer. What a joy it is to come together to, once again as your people, your church. We gather together, Father, some at home, some here. We pray that you might just open our hearts and our mind to your truth, that we might be focused upon you this morning and your word and your person, who you are, who we've come to worship, whose name we've come to lift up. We thank you for the hope that we have in Christ. And so, Father, we pray that you would just guide us this morning, and may our thoughts and the intents of our thoughts be pleasing to you. May you just open our eyes to see wonderful things from your word. May we worship you in spirit and in truth. May you fill us with your spirit and guide us as we go through this service. In all that is said and done, we pray that it might be done for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have a Bible, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 11 for scripture reading. Hebrews chapter 11. Familiar passage, a wonderful chapter, the faith chapter. We're going to be looking at these verses in a few minutes. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 22 through 30. It says, by faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the exit of the sons of Israel and gave orders concerning his bones. By faith, Mo when Moses was born, he was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Considering the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who was unseen. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as though they were passing through a dry land, and the Egyptians, when they attempted it, were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been enriched or encircled for several days. By faith Rahab, the harlot, did not perish with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. May God bless the reading of his word. As we look to the Lord in prayer, we just want to be reminded of to pray for the Press family, Ron and Cheryl. Uh, Ron's mom went to be with the Lord last Sunday. We had the service yesterday. We just pray for them, that you might just bless them and encourage them and comfort their hearts. And we pray for Marge carries her family. Marge went to be with the Lord on Tuesday morning, and uh, she's now home where she's been longing to be for some, for some time. And we're just grateful that we've had this able to have the service yesterday. I took the graveside service and uh, was honored to do so. And just a wonderful time of just remembering and of, of hope and uh, re reminding us the home that we have prepared for us with our Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ. And I want to remember to pray for John and Fred and Fiona and Doug and Doug Tyre and Wanda. Uh, 
Starr and, and others who have had some difficult times, some lost loved ones, moms, spouses, and, and that's always hard, and we, as a church family, want to continue to pray for them, support them, encourage them any way that we can, and we just pray that you, we would hold them up before you. And I ask would you pray for our Sunday school, for Awana. Sunday school will be starting, as we saw the announcements, on the 13th of September. Awana, Lord willing, uh, after Thanksgiving, Canadian Thanksgiving. And so just to continue to pray uh, for wisdom in that regard. Can you pray for our leadership, our nation's leaders? And these are difficult days. There's a lot of stuff going on that's troubling and upsetting. And we certainly want to commit our countries to the Lord and to the leadership as well. So let's just look to the Lord as we go to him in prayer. Father, we are grateful for who you are, you creator. You number the stars, you know which star by name, which boggles our mind. We don't even know how many stars there are, but there are billions, and you know every one of them by name. But even more staggering than that is you know us by name, your people. You have your eye on your people. You care for your people. You watch out for your people. Those who love you, those who know you, those who have come to saving faith through Jesus Christ for what he did, his death on the cross, his dying on the cross for them, and you adopted us into your family and blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And we, we cannot begin to comprehend the blessings and the, what awaits those who love you and know you. Yes, wonder, it's wonderful this side of heaven, but it's going to be even greater on the other side of the grave. To be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord, and to enter into the joy and the fullness and the beauty and the sinlessness of heaven. And Lord, what a joyful and beautiful place that is going to be, mostly because we're going to be with you. And we will be with loved ones, but the joy of heaven in your presence is fullness of joy. And we look forward to that day. We look for that day. We look for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. We, we pray, Lord, for our nations. Lord, we see so much unrest going on in our country here in Canada, especially south of the border in the U.S., and the violence and the, the unrest. There's so much going on, and we just are burdened by it, but we understand that that's what life is like apart from Christ. It's fear, hopelessness, despair, confusion, and so, Father, we know that really the only answer for this world is the gospel of the grace of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why we're here as a church. That's why you've left us here, to, to go into a lost and dying world with, a, with the light and the life of the gospel and shine it, not in our own opinions and not in our own techniques, but shine it through the word. Preach the word. Preach the gospel, proclaim the good news as you've presented it to us, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and he's coming back. Father, may we be faithful in that proclamation. May we be faithful in living out the changed lives that you have wrought, changed that you have wrought in us through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we pray for our countries. We pray for our leaders who are in difficult positions, on many fronts, uh, we're de they're dealing with something they've never dealt with before, none of us have. And there's a lot of dissension creeping in, and there's a lot of unrest, and there's a lot of second guessing. But we pray, Lord, as your church, that we would stand firm to the word of God, that we'd also pray for our leaders and, and remember that they're doing the best they can in some respects. They, they're as confused as everybody else are. But we pray that you'll give them guidance and understanding and wisdom and a listening ear, listening to the right people. And we pray, Lord, that we soon, very soon we'll see the, the protocols lifted and that we will be able to come together and worship you in freedom. Uh, no mass, and we'll be able to sing. And uh, we look forward to that day. But, Lord, we pray for the press family. You know, bless them today. And, and may they know your comfort and your peace in a very special way. We pray for the Carey family, and we just pray for them as well, that they might know your peace and your presence in a very powerful way, wonderful way. 
We also pray for John and Fred and Fiona and, and uh, Wanda and Wanda Sutherland and Starr and, and Doug, and we just know that these are all grieving people, and we pray that you might be near to them and in a very special way that they might sense your, your peace and your comfort through your spirit in their lives. And look forward to that day when they will meet loved ones again. So, Lord, we thank you for Hastings Park Bible Church. We thank you for each one who comes. We thank you for those who are unable to come as yet and are still home. We just pray for them that you'll give, give them peace. And, and may they be blessed today as they worship together with us through the Internet. And we just pray that you'll just encourage their hearts. And for those of us who've come, we pray that you might just encourage our hearts as well. And that we might just look up for our redemption's drawing nigh. That we might look around for the redemption is needed in this world that we're living in, as we've said. So we thank you for your greatness. We thank you for your grace, for your goodness. We thank you that you are sovereign over this world, that you are working all things according to the counsel of your will. And we pray that your will might be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray for those who are struggling through physical illness and disease and sickness, and, and that we just continue to lift them up before you. You know who they are. And we think of Paige, we continue to lift her up and pray you'll continue to have your healing touch upon her. And we thank you for the good report that there are bits of improvement, it's slow, but we just pray it will continue and that she would be raised back to health once again. So Lord, we just thank you that you're here with us. We pray for your, thank you for your goodness and your grace. And we thank you for your word, which is alive and sharper than a two-edged sword that speaks to us with absolute truth, absolute authority. It's an errant it's from you, it's inspired by your breath, you breathed it out, and it's your word to us, your church, and your people, and may we be faithful to it, and we just pray as we open it today now that you'll help us as we look at Moses and his walk of faith. We pray that it will be a reminder to us that we live by faith and not by sight, and we pray as we just look at these verses for these few moments together that you'll open our eyes so we would see wonderful things from your word. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> this morning we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to be looking at a few of the verses that we read earlier. Last week we looked at John chapter 16, verse 33, where Jesus is basically summing up his address that he's been making to the disciples concerning his going to the cross. He's, they don't understand it yet, but he knows that it's going to happen in a couple, very short time. And he's preparing them for what's about to happen. And he sums it up with three, basically three statements. In me, you will have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Life is made up of decisions. Some are simple and for the most part unimportant. Others are very serious and are given much thought. Some decisions because of procrastination are made for us. But the reality is that we all make decisions. The course and the quality of our lives are determined much more by our decisions than by our circumstances. And our decisions are made in accordance with our hearts and what's going on there. That's why Proverbs says, to guard your heart, for out of it flow the issues of life. Christian living is made up of making right decisions. Holiness is making right decisions. Carnality is making wrong decisions. You can note the maturity of a Christian by the decisions that they make. And what we have in Hebrews, as we know, is a this faith chapter, it's a heroes of faith, some have called it. But it takes us on a journey. It takes us on a journey into the lives of believers we meet in the Old Testament. And it gives us insight into their lives, into their thinking that's really not revealed to us as we read about them in the Old Testament. We, we're gonna, we read about these things about Moses and about Abraham, but we didn't re you don't read them in the Old Testament. This is what they were thinking. This is what they were believing and what they were living for and moving towards. There are things that only God could know. And in these verses, verses 13 to 16, 
God continues to unfold for us their thought process. And that's what we really were looking at last week in John 16. How we view life. How we view the world. What is our philosophy of life? Where is our heart? How do we think? How do we process information? How we view our circumstances and the things that happen to us. All of these areas, all of these things are where faith must be exercised. And one thing as we look at these verses in this chapter and really the whole Bible, we need to remember this. We see in these people a willingness to be used by God for purposes that were far greater and bigger than they would ever imagine. It was not just about them. There was a willingness to be used by God for greater purposes than their own. To use by God for purposes as yet unknown to them. To be used by God to bring a blessing upon people they had never met and did not know for generations down the road. And they were willing to do that. It will be 500 years before these promises will be fulfilled in Abraham's life. Sadly, today in the churches, many churches and in many believers' lives, it's all about me. How will this affect me right now and today? That we want God to be concerned about our purposes, but give little thought to his purposes or show little resolve to get involved in things that are not about me or that will not improve my life or may bring blessings to future generations. There are some who say, I'm only going to work with teens if I have a teenager in the group. If not, what do I care? Why would I give up an an evening to work with kids that aren't even mine? Why would I want to pour into my life young people? Mine are gone, or mine aren't even in there yet. Why should I bother with the kids now? There's nothing in it for me. My kids don't even go anymore, or they're not even ready to go. In many, many other ways, it manifests itself that I'm not going to serve unless there's something in it for me. Fortunately, we do not see that in these men and women in the Old Testament that are in this wonderful chapter. Selfishness or selflessness is not a very common characteristic in the church today. We see a mother who stays home to raise her children and invest in their future, and it seems like an oddity in our culture. We're saying, what are they thinking? We can't understand such a selfish decision. There may be a father that refuses a promotion because it means spending too much time away from home. It means more money, but it means being away from his family. And he says no. These are words and principles that don't sit well in our modern-day church. It's very short-sighted, very self-oriented, and because of that, we have trouble understanding what we're going to be looking at this morning in these verses. It's found in a very important chapter, as we've read in Hebrews. Hebrews 11 is about choices, men and women of God made by faith. Right choices are made on the basis of right faith. And we've said this several times over the last few weeks. I like to walk, and I walk about six days a week, and usually listen to a message or something as I'm walking. I've been listening to Martin Lloyd-Jones recently, and he said something that, that really just rattled around in my brain. There's a lot of room to rattle around in there. And this got in there, and it just sort of bounced around. And he said, there's nothing more practical than belief in God. For many people, they think there's nothing more irrelevant than believing in God. And even people sit in churches think like that. There's nothing more irrelevant than believing in God. But the reality is there's nothing more relevant, there's nothing more practical than belief in God, of having faith in God. And the other side of the coin is there's nothing more, there's nothing more practical than unbelief. Unbelief affects you profoundly. Look at the world that we're living in. 
Look at the violence and the, and the wickedness and the unbelief and the skepticism and the cynicism and the violence and the immorality and the fear and the bitterness and the, the confusion and the fear. What is that, where does that come from? It comes from turning your back on God. Not believing in God has profound, practical, daily imp implications for every life, practically. Practically speaking, so doesn't believing in God have a very practical application to everyday life. And that's what we see in Hebrews. That's what we really see, we really see from, Ab from Genesis to Revelation, the practical re reality of believing in God and how it fleshes itself out in our lives. There are many who outwardly profess faith in God but live as practical atheists. They live as if God doesn't matter. He carries no weight in their lives. His word is irrelevant. It has no authority over their lives. Their faith has no expression in their practical choices and the practical living whatsoever. Which means it's not real saving faith. James tells us this quite clearly. The practical aspect of believing in God that faith without works is dead. Real faith is practical. Real faith is going to show itself in action, in life. Everyone believes something. Everyone. Everyone has faith. Whether they've ever stepped their foot inside the church or not, everybody believes in something or someone. And that faith has a practical implication every day in their life. We want to consider for a few moments this morning Moses in Hebrews chapter 11. We just read it. I won't read it again. But the birth of Moses in verse 23 is the first thing we're drawing our attention to. Because his birth wasn't supernatural. It wasn't unordinary. But it was in a very extraordinary time in the history of Israel, of the Hebrew people. By faith. Moses, when he was born, not M Moses' faith, obviously, but his parents' faith, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because he saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. The circumstances of Moses' birth were anything but ideal. Moses was not born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He was born with a death sentence on his head. They had decided and the rulers of Egypt had put out an edict that everyone, every male born was to be thrown into the river and killed because they were getting too numerous and the people were getting nervous. If they ever got a revolt together, they would overtake them and take over their country. And so they were trying to figure out how to get rid of them, how to st stop the population explosion. And so their answer was to kill all the male babies that were born. Moses was born into a hostile environment. Moses' parents lived in a hostile environment with severe oppression. And I think we, in our nations, we're going to see this getting more and more severe when it comes to churches and our freedom to worship and our freedom to share Christ, and our freedom to live according to the values and the morals that we believe are biblical. And we need to learn and understand the reality of such a life. And we've given great instruction in, in Moses' example as to how to do that. And where we're heading in all of this is I'm going to begin a series in First Peter. And I think First Peter really drives home some very important points about practical points about living in a hostile world. And we'll begin that in a couple of weeks. But we are told in Hebrews that his parents were people who lived by faith. Well, how do we know that? It's one thing to say that. How do we know they lived by faith? Because we can see it. We can see it how they lived and the decisions and the choices that they made. They're not going to throw their baby in the river. Their baby is a gift of God. 
Now, they're not going to get rid of him. They're not going to throw him in the river and kill him. It was during a very bleak period in Israel's history that Moses was born. So did his parents just throw their hands in the air and say, what can we do? The odds are stacked against us. What hope does he have? No, by faith they acted. And we see in Moses' parents a faith that accepts God's plans and God's providence and God's sovereignty. They don't shake their fists at God and say, why us? They understand who God is. They understand God is in control. But it's amazing how many people spend their whole lives lamenting their lot in life. Maybe who they had for parents, or the town they grew up in, or the side of the tracks they grew up in, or their schooling, or the opportunities they had or didn't have, their physical limitations. But when Moses was born, they did not start feeling sorry for themselves. They saw that this child was somehow beautiful and special in God's eyes. The fact is that Moses' parents were not afraid of the king's edict. They were willing to risk their lives and make wise choices, faith-filled choices. And Moses' mother had a plan, and she executed that plan, and then she had to let go. In one way, she did what they asked her to do. She threw her baby in the river. But she didn't just throw him in the river, did she? No, she made a basket, sealed it with pitch so it wouldn't leak, and put him in the basket, and it floated down into the reeds by the castle where the king lived. And one of the Pharaoh's daughter went out, and she heard Moses cry, went and got him, and she said, isn't this one of the Hebrew children? And Moses' sister come up and says, can I get her, his mother? And Maybe she can get someone to take care of her. She said, sure. And so she went to get Moses, his mother. And he, she raised him for probably three or four years. Her plan worked flawlessly. But it worked according to the sovereignty of God. God worked it out. She was convinced that putting her trust in God involved thinking and planning and applying on her part. And she got to raise her son, probably with pay. She reared him during the most impressionable years of his childhood. And that brings us to verse 24. Moses. First thing we read about him is by faith, Moses. Where did he learn about God? Where did he get this faith? Where did he learn about who God was and his forefathers? He learned it on his mother's knee. How do we know if our plans of God are of God or of our own making? I think if they are of God, at some point we're going to have to let go and watch God work. Watch God do what only God can do. If Moses was born at the right time, in the right place, to the right parents, and those parents took that responsibility seriously, and God brought him back, she gave him up and God gave him back to her, and she raised him up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, and she taught him about who God was, Faith means accepting God's plan. Now, verses 24 to 27, we turn our attention to Moses. When he was grown up, when he was grown up, notice what he did. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. The first key word in living by faith is refusing. Moses faced a decision around the age of 40, a crucial decision. Who am I going to be? Where am I going to place my allegiance? Who am I going to identify with? That decision not only calls for a positive choice, which says, I will say yes, it also involves a negative choice saying no. What am I saying no to? Well, we learn in Moses that a walk of faith involves a choice. Who are we going to be? Who are we going to identify with, work with, play with? Who do I choose to to identify with? He was a son of Pharaoh's daughter. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. The son of Pharaoh's daughter. He's been adopted. If you had been Moses' friend, 
colleague, buddy, and he said, hey, can we go out to coffee? I'd like to talk to you about something. What would you have told him when he said, I'm going to refuse to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter? That's not what I want my identity to be. That's not who I am. What would you have said to him? Many people, if not most people, would have no doubt said, at least today, Moses, think about what you're saying here. Think about what you're giving up. Think about the prestige and the power and the authority and the riches and the esteem and the comforts and the hobnobbing with dignitaries. and You're set for life. You've got no financial worries. Life on a silver platter. It doesn't get any better than this. Moses, don't throw this all away. Think. Think. Think about the temptations Moses must have been facing, the struggles, the wrestling. And I'm sure he wrestled a bit with this. He's human. But here's the temptation he's facing. And here's what people would be telling him if he was alive today. Maybe they were telling him back then too. Moses, you can have it all. You can have it both ways. You can be friendly to the Hebrew people. You can fit in both worlds. You can identify with both groups. You don't have to make a choice. You just have to make a few compromises and everything will be fine. Don't refuse to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Instead, refuse to think you have to make a choice. Refuse to think holiness means to come out and be separate. Refuse to believe you have to take up your cross and follow Christ. That's what we hear today. That you don't have to make a choice. Like the rich young ruler who came to Jesus, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus confronted him with a choice. Sell all you have and come and follow me. That's not what he wanted to hear. He came hoping he wouldn't have to make a choice. Hoping he can just add Jesus. But that's not the way it works. To say yes to Jesus is to say yes to every other religion. You cannot be a Hindu and believe in Jesus Christ and keep on being a Hindu. You cannot worship Baal or Buddha and keep on worshiping Baal and Buddha but yet add Jesus to the mix. It doesn't work like that. You can't do that. That's not... Christianity at all but the the temptation today is in many many circles is to refuse to think that you have to make a choice everything will be fine just add Jesus to your life add Jesus to the mix say a few good things go to church every now and then and you can be as worldly as you want on the rest of the week and be as godly as you want on Sunday you don't have to choose Moses loved God's people. He loved God's people. He loved God, and he knew what God wanted him to do. Moses had lived in this worldly system. Now think about this. Moses had lived and been brought up in this worldly system, the schools, probably the best teaching that there was. He'd been taught in the highest schools of learning. He'd enjoyed his riches. He'd risen in esteem and power in the eyes of the leaders. And just like Daniel, but just like Daniel, all of these teaching, all of this stuff had not shaped who he was. God did. A godly mother and father did. His love for God and God's people had not diminished. He knew who he was. I think so many times parents sometimes and we think that we've got to send our kids to public school and I realize public schools are a lot different than they were when I was in, in them. But they, they think they just throw their hands in the air, well, what can we do? We, they're going to public school, we're going to lose them, we're going to, they're going to rebel. And it, Moses didn't, Daniel didn't. Just because they're in that system doesn't mean they have to conform to that system. Just because they're in there does not mean they have to become like it. Moses grew up 
and probably the most worldly system you could find, but he did not allow it to shape who he was, nor did Daniel. He cared nothing for his Egyptian heritage or advantages. He had given himself to much greater things. If you're a child of God, don't settle for being the son of Pharaoh's daughter because it's a step down. If God calls you to serve, don't step down and become the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Remember, he had it all. He could have just looked the other way and said, hey, I've got all I need. What do I care? It doesn't concern me. It has nothing to do with me. It's not my problem. It's not my kids. Why inconvenience myself I don't have, if I don't have to? But a walk of faith needs, number one, refusing. Refusing is as much as an act of faith as choosing. What we say no to is, important, is, is as important as what we say yes to. So refusing, verse 24, verse 25, choosing to be mistreated with God's people, to identify with the people of God. And sometimes that can be hard. Because <clears throat> sometimes, well, as Corinthians says, 1 Corinthians, God has chosen the foolish things, the simple things, the unimpressive things. And sometimes hobnobbing with God's people isn't exactly to hang around with the elite, even as high school or at work. You know the guy at work who reads his Bible at lunchtime in the coffee room. Everybody jokes about him, laugh at him, poke fun at him. You know he goes to your church. You've seen him. You know he's a believer. Which, whose side do you take? You're going to refuse or you're going to choose? You're going to refuse to hang, take up with your friends and laugh at them, not stick up for them, or are you going to choose to go sit with them and be with them and read his Bible, have a Bible study together? Instead of clinging to the esteem and the favor of your coworkers, we all have to make choices. We all have to choose. He chose, Moses chose to endure ill treatment with the people of God and to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. No one need to be, needs to be convinced that, convinced that sin is often fun for a while. If you think a good reproach to evangelism is asking people if they want to be happy, you may want to rethink that approach because sin can bring pleasure. But sin is always evil. It has no good in it, and it can bring no good to us or anything or anyone else or to God. Sin's pleasure is always passing. And your sins will always find you out and hunt you down, and you will suffer, the, as in many cases, the law of unintended consequences. Sin is pleasurable for a while. But what was the, what was the sin that Moses would have been guilty of if he chose to refuse? It helps us see what sin really is, the bottom line of sin. Moses was not immoral. He was not an idol worshiper. He didn't lose, use the Lord's name in vain. He wasn't a thief. He wasn't covetousness. We always associate this pleasure with some illicit relationship or passion or loving money or something. But Moses wasn't a glutton. He wasn't a lover of money. Well, what sin is this talking about? It's the sin of simply doing this. Just stay here in Egypt. Live a moral life, worship your own God, get married, be a good testimony, tell people about your God, still encourage your people, but you can also still enjoy the perks of being the son of Pharaoh's daughter. But where's the sin in that? It's moral, he's upright, he's going to church, he has the best of both worlds, he didn't turn into some kind of religious fanatic, but where's the sin? It's simple. It's not what God called him to do. Self is the focus, not God. Sin is disobedience. Sin is turning our back on what God wants us to do and calls us to do. It's disobedience. Refusing and choosing are daily occurrences in the walk of faith. Moses was a somebody who chose to by faith to be, be, to be a nobody, at least in the eyes of the world. 
Moses was a somebody who chose by faith to be a nobody in the eyes of the world. How unlike that are we today? How unlike that are we? How about yourself? Everything today is about his American Idol and becoming famous, and you're, not, you're nothing if you're not famous, you're nothing if you're not rich. J.R. Miller has given some wonderful insight into what the everyday life is like for the Christian. And listen to these words. Perhaps the everyday life, perhaps the everyday of life is not as interesting as are some of the bright special days. It is apt to be somewhat monotonous. It's just like a great many other days. It is only a plain, common day. With just the same old wearisome routine of tasks and duties and happenings which have come so often before. Yet it is the every day which is really the best measure and the test of noble living. Anyone can do well on special occasions. Anybody can be good on Sunday. Anybody can be bright and cheerful and exhilarating company. Anybody can do a heroic thing once or twice in a lifetime. These are beautiful things. They shine like lofty peaks above life's plains. But the ordinary attainment of the common days is a truer index of the life and heart, a truer measure of its character and value than are the most striking and brilliant things of its exalted moments. It requires more strength to be faithful in the 99 commonplace duties when no one is looking on than it does in the one duty which is by its unusual importance or by its conspicuousness arouses enthusiasm for its own doing. Thus, it is that one's everyday life is a sure revealer of noble character the one's public acts. There are people who are magnificent when they appear on great occasions, wise and eloquent and masterly, but who are almost unutterably endure, unendurable in their fretfulness, their unreasonableness, and all manner of selfish disagreeableness in the privacy of their own homes to those whom they ought to show all of life's love's gentleness and sweetness. On the other hand, there are people who are never heard of on the street whose names never appear in the newspapers, who do no great conspicuous things, whose lives have no glittering peaks towering high. And yet the impact of their lives is rich in its beauty and in its fullness of love. It is in the everyday of life that nearly all the world's best work is done. It's not from the few conspicuous deeds of life that the blessings chiefly come which make the world better, sweeter, and happier. But from the countless humble services of the everydays, the little faithfulnesses which fill long years. Let that sink in. Let that sink in deep down in your heart. There's nothing more practical than believing in God. There's nothing more practical than walking by faith. I think we have an example of what Miller's talking about in Peter's life, and we've used this example before. How he was ready to die for Christ in the garden. He cut off the servant's ear with his sword when they came to take Jesus away, and in that adrenaline rush, and when everything was just, everybody was excited, they were taking away Jesus, and he'll die for him. The one big act, her heroic, but just a few hours later, in the everyday, ordinary, warming yourself by the fire, what's he do? He denies him three times. It's the everyday of life that nearly all the world's best work is done. At the home, just everyday stuff. Everyday stuff. It's not great, wonderful vacations are wonderful. We should have them. Take them. 
but you're going to shape your child's life, character, by the everyday things of life. God is working in us every day, little by little. Just like we grow when we're young, every day we grow a little bit taller. It's minuscule, but you come back after a year, look at it and say, my, you've grown. And nobody saw it happen, who were with you every day, but it happened. And that's what it's like in the Christian life sometimes. When you go away and you come back to visit somebody and you, you say, wow, has God done a work in you? You've grown. And it was just a long process of everyday life. Has your heart been changed? Has it been made anew by the, through the cross of Jesus Christ? Have you been forgiven and changed? Have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ who came and died on a cross that we might be delivered from sin and our aimless, empty, meaningless way of life, that we might have hope, that we might be brought back into a right relationship with God? When we confess Christ as our Savior, he gives us a new heart, new desires. We become a new creation all by grace through faith. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. By grace you've been saved through faith, he says. Not, it's not of your own doing. It's a gift of God. Not a result of works that no one may boast. So as we close, may I ask those of you who have been, been created in Christ Jesus unto good works, are you walking in them every day? As a wife, as a husband, as a parent, as a believer in Christ, as a member of a church, someone who's been gifted by God to serve, are you serving? Are you serving Jesus Christ? Not because there's something in it for you, but because God has called you to this, and he wants you to build into other people for their sake, not your sake. And God will bless you that our focus is not ourselves, it's Christ. Are we shining as lights in the midst of a wicked and perverse generation? Are we seeking to glorify God in our everyday world? John says, truly, truly, I say to you, or Jesus says in John 12, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. What are the areas we are serving in that are not about us, but just for the good of those who are there? just for the joy of serving and being used by God to meet a need in someone's life. Our faith will impact our own everyday world in a practical, everyday way. But we have to refuse and we have to choose. What do our choices say about where our faith really lies? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these truths, for the example of Moses and through many others in the word of God and down through history. Many of us have been impacted by those who have refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter but choose to suffer, choose to say no to some very wonderful things and to go out and say, Lord, use me. Our lives have been touched by such people. May our lives touch people as well because of these choices that we've made and are making every day in our life as parents, as husband and wife, as Christians. Lord, may you work in us and through us. May Christ be seen in us, in our brokenness, in our willingness to be used. May the light of Christ shine through the cracks in our life that Christ might be magnified and lifted up and the world may see, and they say, there's something different about you I can't put my finger on. And we'll tell them it's not 
anything in this world. What you're seeing is Christ in us, the hope of glory. He's changed our life. We no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died and gave his life for us. For me to live as Christ and to die is gain. That's the heart of the believer. There's nothing more practical than believing in God. So, Father, may we, you lay your hand upon each heart and each life. And there may be some who have been going through the motions, maybe for, for years and years and years. But inwardly, their heart has never been changed. Outwardly, you can't tell because they do all the right things. They go to church, they give. But, Father, their heart hasn't been changed because it's all a show. It's all a show. So, Lord, we pray that you would just remind us of the spirit who lives within us and that he might strengthen us. We realize there is a battle going on between the flesh and the spirit, and we pray that we would submit to the spirit and he would have victory in our lives as we seek to live for you and glorify you, and we would be denying the flesh, saying no to the flesh, and that Christ will live mightily through us every day, at home, at work, wherever we are, that Christ might be magnified in our lives, whether through life or through death, and the things that happen to me would turn out for the furtherance of the gospel. The gospel is not about me. It's about Christ. And may Christ be magnified in us and through us to his glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.